the political side of it, and then there's the real story. There's a lot to unpack right there. It wasn't quite the interview I thought that was going to be. There's a reason for it. This will be officially my favorite podcast I've ever done. I think what I want to get into right away is, uh, you know, we mine Bitcoin. Uh, we have a Bitcoin marketplace where we're building a, a marketplace around around Bitcoin um, with BitNow. But what are your thoughts of the current state? It's like uh, uh, I'm watching things like uh, Argo and um, uh, Core and others, a little implosion at, uh, at uh, Compute North. It, it, I, you know, I've been around the market a long time. This seems like a normal cycle where there's this boom bust that happens. It happened with the internet. It happened with thousands of car companies going down to three or four car companies. Where do you think we are in the cycle with Bitcoin? So mining is tough right now. So in addition to Bitcoin miners being exposed to the challenges of a Bitcoin bear market, we also have this black swan event of the Russian war in Ukraine, which has created additional pressure on Bitcoin miners. Now, um, you know, I think that Bitcoin miners have historically been some of the most resilient and quickest to pivot and diversify their businesses as any other um, operator in the sector. And so I remain optimistic even for the public companies that are going through challenges. That said, I think it's become very clear that diversifying revenue away from, you know, primarily producing Bitcoin is something that will, will or could advantage Bitcoin mining companies, especially as a scale. And where Stillmark is focused at the earlier stages of innovation, Todd, we have never seen more innovation or more entrepreneurs going after the mining market in a really smart and creative way. And so while the public market companies are suffering, entrepreneurs are diving in with you know, really fascinating new approaches to capitalize on the mining opportunity. In, your, in the world around building on the, the, the Bitcoin algorithm, are there, is the kind of stuff you're doing building on the algorithm? Are you building on some other algorithm around Bitcoin? Because I, I know we're, we're switching topics really quickly from Bitcoin to building on Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, to building on, uh, uh, we're from mining to building on Bitcoin. But I've been fascinated about what, what Jack's doing with uh, Lightning and what are you seeing happening with building actually on the algorithm? Of course. So Stillmark is a venture capital fund focused on pre-seed, seed, series A stage companies. We do some growth stage investing, but the core is early stage. In that early stage mandate, we're looking at three buckets of activities. So we're looking at companies that are helping financialize BTC, the asset. Then we're looking at companies building in the mining space. And finally, we're looking at companies building on top of Bitcoin's core protocol to develop the, the payments network, Lightning Network, for example, or other second layer technologies atop Bitcoin, and then companies building even on top of that. So second and third layer protocols based on Bitcoin, and then the companies that integrate with those protocols. So there's incredibly robust activity happening there. And I imagine that you and your audience are familiar with a lot of it, but one area where Stillmark has focused over the past couple of years has been in the Lightning Network space. Yeah, that's something actually our, our, our chief uh, product officer is here today because uh, we are obviously building out a marketplace uh, called BitNile where we're gonna allow people to take, merchants to take Bitcoin as payment, but also allow them to convert crypto into 40, or 40 other cryptos into Bitcoin directly. We're gonna reward them for using Bitcoin with a token that rewards them on the network. It's sort of an in closed loop system. Um, but I, I'm a big believer in it, but there are a lot of people that thought that maybe we should build on other platforms. I'm curious as to why you think Bitcoin is the best platform in your mind. So there's a few reasons, but, but from an entrepreneur's perspective, Bitcoin offers the most stable infrastructure. And of course, when you're building a business or a payments network, a protocol that you expect financial activity to happen on top of, stability is important, uptime is important, the dependability and the reliability of the protocol is important. And so what that means practically is that are the rules that are applied to you when you're engaging with this technology, are they consistent? Will they change? And will you have access to send payments or to your money when you need it? And so Bitcoin historically has been just that. And in fact, that's what 
the open source Bitcoin developers optimize for. And, and it creates a really lovely entrepreneurial environment where you can just depend that Bitcoin will be there in the same way we've gotten used to knowing that the internet will be there. That's, that's the, the path that Bitcoin is progressing on. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons for why Bitcoin from a builder's perspective. I, I, th I guess you'd call this a softball, because I think I know the answer, but I'm, it's not intended to be a softball, so I apologize to the audience in advance. But do you think Jack's gonna be successful with this? Because I, I, the, the Lightning Network has a lot of promise, but I, I, I think there's some scary parts about, you know, Bitcoin has never been hacked, but, but bridges have been hacked, things like that have been hacked. And I'm curious as to what you're, you think about where Jack is in the cycle. And for those who people are watching, we're talking about what's going on with the Lightning Network. Okay, so there's so many good Jacks in Bitcoin. I presume that you're talking about Jack Mallers from Stripe. Yeah, I am. Or is yeah, it? Yeah, I, I am. Yeah, I okay. apologize. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I we're, we're we're in the same business, you and I, and so even though we don't know each other, this is the first time meeting. I know who you are. Um, so I apologize for that. Sorry. So Jack, so Jack Mallers and Strike is working on um, advancing the utility of Bitcoin's Lightning Network for payments and for remittances. And then we also have another famous Jack working on Bitcoin is Jack Dorsey, who has taken a comprehensive approach to what can be built in Bitcoin and has, including what can be built with Lightning Network. So Yeah, hold on a second, hold on. I've short, never heard of that guy, Jack Dorsey. What, what does he do? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. He, so at lots of good Jacks in this space. We're yeah, very blessed. exactly, exactly, um, exactly. So, you know, what's interesting about the Lightning Network has been the emergence in the past couple of years of this really tight adoption feedback and then infrastructure innovation loop. And so what we've been seeing is Lightning Network has been launched, especially in developing markets where there's an acute need for payments and payments technology. Um, what we're seeing is developers leading the charge. And in developing markets, that's really been the developers at Lightning Labs. So this is a team led by Elizabeth Stark and Lalu or Rose Deep as CTO. And so as they've launched Lightning Network to provide payment capability for folks that don't have access to a credit card or a debit card in developing markets, what, what the developers at Lightning Labs and the other companies advancing Bitcoin's payment network have done is they've been really good at looking at the KPIs coming from first engagement and from user adoption and then iterating upon that. So let's let's zoom in on an example. We know that in 2021, in late 2021, Lightning Network was introduced in El Salvador when the president of El Salvador um, pushed forward his proposal for Bitcoin to be adopted as legal tender. And so it, to accompany that, that introduction of Bitcoin as legal tender, El Salvador airdropped $30 of Bitcoin to every to most adults in the country. And all of the economic activity that was catalyzed by that project was happening on top of Lightning Network and primarily on top of LND, the, the LND implementation of Lightning Network, which is produced by Lightning Labs. And from that activity, what we saw was that the way that Salvadorans were going to use Lightning Network and to take advantage of this $30 of BTC instead of saving it, which many of us do in developed markets and then when we have the financials standing to sort of be able to tolerate Bitcoin's volatility, instead of that, what Salvadorans were doing was they were going grocery shopping or they were going to the pharmacy to pick up a medication for their son or taking their families out to dinner. So at Pizza Hut, as an example, was a big beneficiary of this airdrop. Now, in response to the observation of how Lightning Network was used, Lightning Labs went back and innovated a new protocol called Taro. And what Taro will do is it will allow for other digital assets to be exchanged on Lightning Network. Most importantly, that includes stable coins. So in an economy like El Salvador, where there's, a, where there's an acute need for financial rails for payments, People can adopt that technology without needing to be exposed to Bitcoin's volatility. And so I think when we talk about Lightning Network, we need to do that in the context of acknowledging these really um, tight feedback loops where the end users are able to um, inform and um, sort of advise on where the network goes. 
Uh, wow. I, I love that story. I, I love the air The idea of airdropping and doing that and sort of having it adopted in El Salvador, I just think is such a great event for Bitcoin. What do you think about people adopting in terms of it being a legal tender in other places? It's not, the adoption hasn't happened as fast as I would like to see. Of course, I think it should be adopted around the, I mean, to me, uh, and I guess who cares really about my opinion, but my opinion is that Bitcoin's here to stay. It's the dominant player. It's the immaculate conception. It's the original. There's no way to put that in a bottle. You can't create a new one. There's no way to fix that story. It's not like a Google surpassing a Yahoo. It's There's only really one Bitcoin, right? You remember the days when Yahoo was the search engine and there was Alta Vista and all these others and Google in, iterated and innovated past them as a company. But to me, Bitcoin is a foundational event that happened that you can't put, you know, I'm, 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 I'm talking, uh, I'm channeling Alex a little bit, uh, Svetsky about his I, Immaculate Conception concept here. Um, but I'm curious as to why you think other companies or countries haven't done that yet. And it's sort of like, how does that evolve in your mind with out of El Salvador? Well, I think that El Salvador, El Salvador taking the position that they were comfortable to be a first mover and an example for other developing markets uh, was really important. And I hope that as a result of that, that the people, Salvadorans um, and businesses and the country of El Salvador in general will get this unfair advantage, this first mover advantage. Now, um, lessons will be pulled from what they did. So you said a lot in that question. There's a few questions in there, but you and I, Todd, are really on the same page and that we both acknowledge that Bitcoin is categorically different from other cryptocurrencies and digital assets and that there's a lot of advantage to be had across the globe by adopting Bitcoin. And, um, you know, we're on the same page that we hope to see a Bitcoin standard advance. But but that said, we have to acknowledge that it challenges those that have, you know, been at the reins of monetary and fiscal policy. And what Bitcoin, you know, sort of demands is that we all come to the system as equal participants and that there's and that we relinquish the concept of authority and financial transactions. And so a Salvadoran, an unbanked Salvadoran should have the same access and the same rules applied to them as someone of privilege in the U.S., for example, and um, or even as someone in El Salvador that might be of higher means or status. And so I think that that concept of equal access, you know, to financial um, systems and to money in general is very challenging to those who have power now, especially who have power to make the rules. The rules in Bitcoin, of course, are set and enforced by software. They're unchanging, they're not dynamic. And I think that that's, that's threatening to many. You also talked about Bitcoin being different. So just a quick note there, that there's certain things that Satoshi did in introducing Bitcoin that haven't been replicated by others and that have allowed Bitcoin to differentiate itself um, in a way that can't be replicated. So, and it's important to acknowledge that Bitcoin was not point zero. So Bitcoin is based on a couple of decades of prior work of people that were attempting to get to Bitcoin, to get to a place where finance and money could be separate from state and from aggregation of power. And so, you know, Bitcoin emerged from all of that work. Now what Satoshi did was he, uh, he found a way to match up various technologies that already existed such that it, disparate stakeholders could be incentivized to, to work together, really. Um, and that's what Bitcoin was originally. Bitcoin the asset was a way to align the incentives of people transacting, core developers, and very importantly, the people that secure the system, the miners, like yourself. Once Bitcoin was up and running and was sort of on stable ground, Satoshi took a step back. And by doing that, he allowed for the authority that he may have had over the system, over the rules to dissipate, and it wasn't passed to others. And so instead of there being sort of a head of state in Bitcoin, there was just a simple set of software rules that everyone could audit, everyone could participate in, in terms of um, voicing their, their you know, sort of opinion. 
And, um, and people could assure that when they were transacting in the system, that the same rules applied to them today, as did yesterday, as did to their, their peers or others that were different from them. And uh, that's something that's, that, can, that is unique of a system that doesn't have a leader. And so Bitcoin's different in that way. And I think that because of that, it's a, it's a reasonable system of finance and a reasonable asset for everyone to opt into if they choose to diversify off of their local fiat. And unfortunately, I could talk to you all day, but I know you can't talk to me all day. Um, I have a lot of common investors, the average person, um, clear as day that you've been in this a long time, the game in a long time. You like Bitcoin, obviously. You know a lot more about it than I do. I simply just mine it, and I'm fascinated with the fact that I think that it's... Um, what I am is a student of history, right? And so I've looked back and looked at all the different fiat currencies and realized none of them ever really survive in their first format, right? They evolve and iterate over time. And so to me, Bitcoin is an iteration of a global system that allows the average person to not allow the government to effectively tell them what to do. But in some weird way, Bitcoin is actually more transparent than anything, even US dollars, because you know every transaction that happens on the chain if I were to say today where Bitcoin is now and you were to say, where do you think it was going to be in the future? Like if I look forward, say, and I'm a long-term thinker, so let's just look forward together 10 years from now or even five years. Let's do five years, simple, simpler time frame. Um, what do you think Bitcoin looks like in its current format? Like uh, does, does the U.S. adopt it in terms of like making it more standardized and, and cl clearer regulation? What would you think could happen over the next five years? Five years is hard to predict, it's but really let's hard. see. So yeah. Bitcoin is on a path to, to, there's a lot of things happening. So maybe let's break it down, starting with adoption. Bitcoin is on, is on a path of rapid adoption. It's exceeded, its adoption over the past few years has exceeded the pace of adoption of the World Wide Web even. So we expect that to continue. We know that one of the things that drive, helps drive adoption is the existence of common familiar on-ramps. So people being able to buy Bitcoin and participate in the ecosystem without really changing the, the course of their day. And so when Cash App, for example, allows people to purchase Bitcoin in the app, or when a, a financial institution allows their investors, their, the people that bank with them, to, to diversify into Bitcoin, that moves the needle in terms of adoption, especially as we build up to a next full market. Now, we know that historically, Bitcoin adoption has been positively correlated with the appreciation of Bitcoin's price or its exchange rate against USD. Um, the other thing that we know that's happening is that there's been this really rapid maturation of Lightning Network, Bitcoin's payment network. That has implications for us as individuals that want to transact um, outside of the bank's, you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday, permissioned transaction period. Um, but I think that the way that Lightning Network is advancing is not just relevant for peer-to-peer -peer human interactions, but will also impact machine-to-machine -machine style of communication. We don't talk about that much, but to give um, an example, again, referencing back to Lightning Labs, which is, a, which is also a still mark portfolio company. Um, Lightning Labs has introduced a protocol called LSAT, which allows for small pieces of data to be transacted along with Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. And practically what that means is that a machine can communicate, send a, a bit of information and get paid for it, or can pay in order to access, say, a claim or a membership even. Um, and so I expect that over the course of the next five years that we'll see more folks start to experiment with those sorts of capabilities. And, and then that really expands what you can do on the web and with the internet. So if there was, there, there has not been in a form of internet native money before Bitcoin and Lightning Network allows Bitcoin to be the internet's native form of money. I don't think we've really seen the potential of that yet, but over the next five years, I believe that the entrepreneurs that are, you know, taking a look at how it can be applied, will will start to gain traction. I'm going to do that. So I think the future, the future in 10 years will look a lot different than what we can imagine today. I'm going to do something really unusual. Skyla, go get Douglas for me. 
I, I, there's no way that this is a, a happy accident. I think we're actually, I think we're actually in collaboration with, um, I think we're in collaboration with, with uh, the lab company you just suggested that name. Is it Lightning Labs? Yeah. Yes, Lightning Labs. Okay, um, I'm gonna get our chief product officer on the podcast. There's just no way I, I can't. I, 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 I've heard that name a million times, I'm pretty sure. There's two things that I yeah. mentioned that I'll repeat now that Lightning Labs is working on. So Stillmark invested in Lightning Labs at the Series A and, and has known the team for quite a while. So, and as you probably know, Lightning Labs promotes the, the most popular implementation of Lightning Network. So in addition to that, they've introduced two related protocols, one which is called LSAT and allows basically machine to machine payments. And the way it does that is by allowing small pieces of data to be attached to Lightning payments. So that say, for example, you could monetize per API call. So you could say, if you, if you send a request for an image to be produced, or let's, let's use Google Maps as an example. If you send a request to Google Maps for directions from point A to B, Google Maps can charge part of a penny for that request. And while, while Google may not be apt to adopt such an approach, you know, this sort of unlocks other forms of machine to machine communication and makes Bitcoin um, the, the native digital form of payment for the web. The other protocol I mentioned, which I imagine you've seen because it's been in the, in the news lately is Tarot Protocol which allows for digital assets beyond Bitcoin to be transacted on Bitcoin's Lightning Network. So practically speaking, what that means is that these assets can sort of piggyback on the liquidity of the Lightning Network, which is all provided, of course, in Bitcoin, and also be settled with the security of Bitcoin's um, core blockchain. Um, but you can get the flexibility of using other assets. And the reason why I mentioned that to Todd is because it does something important in developing markets, which allows, you know, poor people, people without the means to, to save or um, without much means to save or without the ability to tolerate Bitcoin's volatility, they can still use the Lightning Network by using stable coins on Bitcoin's Lightning Network. So those, those were my comments about Lightning Labs. I think if you look at where we're headed, the only way it becomes really a viable payment method in the future is transacting the Lightning Network. Um, I think. Yes. It, right. So I think a lot of us were hoping that, you know, at this stage, it would be a little bit further along. Seems like some of that conversation is sort of stalled a little bit. Uh, we haven't given up hope. So it's still in our planning and it, we're still looking at, at a, a potential provider. So I, I think that's where you heard us talk about them because they're definitely on that short list. Right. So anything you can do to help us facil facilitate that conversation um, would be fantastic. He's got a big important meeting, someone in town <laughs> uh, about about the marketplace, and I just uh, I'm I'm you know I could talk about Bitcoin all day long, so I, I I've got a I had no choice but to bring you in. Yeah, um, I appreciate it. Thanks, Douglas. Um, Elise, I wanted to talk about. Uh, I know you're related. You're you worked with Blockstream, and I don't know how long you can talk about this, but there was a deal for them, and a bunch of things fell apart. Um, where do you think the state of the industry is now that uh, what's happened to Voyager, uh, kind of oh, where, yeah. uh, XR, where do you think, what's the state of the industry in terms of after that kind of mess with Voyager? Yes, I don't think Blockstream was related to Voyager in any way. So, um, did I, did so I miss that? I Cause I thought, I thought, I'm not saying they're related to Voyager, but I thought that Blockstream had a, a deal where they were being bought. Am I wrong or did I have that incorrect? Oh no, that's incorrect. Oh. Well, I've, I've been wrong before, but that doesn't I'm change. sure not often, but yeah. that, that one is not correct. So, uh, but no, this so, so Blockstream is in a particularly good position, and this is related to what I said earlier about diversification of revenue for miners, for miners that are on a path to the public market or that are in the public market. Remember that Blockstream develops the full stack of Bitcoin infrastructure. And when I say full stack, I mean everything from Blockstream has developers committing code to Bitcoin Core. It has developers working on sidechain technologies. Block, Blockstream sidechain technology is called Liquid Network. It's building a Lightning Network implementation CLN. 
otherwise referred to as Core Lightning. It, Blockstream has even launched satellites or satellite software, I should say, that creates redundancy in the Bitcoin blockchain. So should the internet go down, you can still send a Bitcoin payment via Blockstream satellites. Software, wow. Blockstream wow. Satellite software. Wow. Wow. So Blockstream is, is not just mining, but they are mining. They are hosting. They're hosting institutional grade clients, um, but it's it's a diversified company and um, and they're sort of doing it all. So this is it's a it's a novel approach. But I think that by by proposing that you can sort of apply insights driven from development of other technologies to mining and vice versa, it allows us to sort of take a comprehensive view of the market. Um, and well, I, I should probably, you know, make sure that I keep the balance of what should be private and, you know, what I can speak about. But I think that, you know, it's been a pleasure to be involved with Blockstream for as long as I have, because they've been comfortable being at the forefront of various forms of innovation. And mining is, is no exception. Where do you call home? What city? I'm in California. Oh, really? I'm in well, Southern California. Oh, yes. really? That's where I grew up. I grew up in Orange County, California. Wow. Um, well, it's a beautiful area. So I grew up in the Bay Area, and now I'm in Southern California. And it's been, that was a really great place to learn about Bitcoin. So I found Bitcoin, um, you know, working out of a startup co-working space in Los Angeles in 2013 from someone, Todd, that was mining with a machine on their desk. <laughs> Um, and so it's been a hub of entrepreneurial activity and really lovely to be present um, and engaged here. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to make you vomit in a second if I told you that we mined 5,000 Bitcoin that we sold for five bucks. Uh-oh, when was that? Uh, a long time ago. It sounds like it was earlier than yeah. 2013. Yeah, uh, it, yes. it was a long time ago, yeah. It's, it was hard to be involved early. There was many mistakes to be made and everyone that, you know, there's no one that was unscathed by some of those early mistakes. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have made some of them myself, a, a fair amount of those mistakes for sure. Um, so what in your in terms of venture capital, I like to, you know, I, we're going to wrap it up shortly. And I would love to come back and have a conversation with you. In fact, uh, for many reasons, I'd love to fly you to Vegas and have you on the show in, and, and, and see the staff and talk about what you're doing in venture capital. But Moving, moving aside. I never that, say no to Vegas. M moving aside from that, you're uh, Stillmark. What kind of clients do you take in Stillmark? Is it just institutional? Do you take high net worth? And how can someone find out about it? Or is it closed off? Yes. So Stillmark. Um, so in my venture capital career, which has spanned about the past decade, I've worked with high net worth individuals, family offices, institutional investors, all of that. And really what I hope is special about Stillmark is that we are forming, we are privileged to have really close relationships with all of the people that we work with, including our founders, such that these are, you know, really not just transactional relationships, but we have the privilege of being able to work with people that are excited about Bitcoin and want to contribute. And this is the really cool thing about Bitcoin venture capital right now is that in addition to being able to participate in the growth of private stage companies, you also have the opportunity to sort of contribute to Bitcoin's adoption and the expansion of Bitcoin's utility. And so it's, a, it's really the reason why I got into Bitcoin investing in 2014 was because it felt like a way to really do well at work while doing good work and meaningful work. And, and I feel the same way today as I did back then. So it's a lovely place to work. On the founder side, people can always reach out. It's never too early to ping us. And we love talking to folks that are just brainstorming new ideas. And all of the information about how to contact us is on our website, stillmark.com. Is Stillmark uh, raising any new funds or are you closed off right now? You know, we don't talk much about about raising funds, um, but we're actively investing. And so it's, um, you know, the inbox is always full, but in a lovely way, because it's it's a pleasure to talk to these founders that have decided to commit their time to doing good work in the world. Yeah, I know, so I, know you, I know you live we're in always a, here. You live in a world like I do where you're not supposed to really talk about fundraising. So I get that code for code for 
You never know, right? I, I get that. I totally understand. Um, when it, when it comes to other cryptos, like other, you know, like Ethereum and the state of of, of regulation. Do you focus any time on the other other cryptocurrencies like uh, like an Ethereum or you know or a Polkadot or any of these others that are out there? Do you give any time to it, or do you focus all your energy on Bitcoin? Well, we pay attention because we want to see if there's anything that will gain traction in terms of utility that's sustainable. So we're really looking for sustainable traction, and the reason why is that that activity we expect to ultimately uh, move over to Bitcoin. And so because we always want to be ahead of the game and identifying those trends, we're going to pay attention in that way. Um, but really what you have to consider when you're looking at what's going on either in Bitcoin or in other ecosystems, crypto ecosystems, is which pieces of this are a simple regulatory arbitrage play? And do we expect to dissipate if regular regulators pay more close attention to what's happening? And we're looking for something something in addition to that that's unlocked by the tech. So does, for example, Lightning Network do something that you couldn't otherwise do regardless of the regulatory environment? And yes, of course it does. Um, that might be different from what we've seen happening in, in DeFi spaces otherwise in Ethereum, for example. So we're paying close attention, but when we look at the metrics of what's happening, we, we're asking the hard questions and trying to discern you know, what's what's real utility beyond a regulatory arbitrage plan and, you know, what's gambling, what's not. And the pieces that aren't gambling, we're looking for founders to build those on Bitcoin, too. Appreciate your time. I uh, hope we can talk again. This was a little disjointed for me. I know I'm uh, I'm pretty excited about hearing about it. So it was more of a uh, I probably would have wanted to go down to some rabbit holes that we didn't go down. Um, uh, I hope there's an opportunity to meet you in person. Um, of Lisa, course. Lisa, I appreciate, there your will be. I appreciate your time so far. The reality is, it sounds like to me, you're really smart in this space and you're doing great uh, stuff around Bitcoin, which we love. We love to support it. And um, I hope you'll consider it. And I'm going to advance it. We have a Bitcoin day every year at our Risk On conference. Last year, we had uh, Perry Unboring there. Natalie Brunel was there. Um, we had uh, we had Greg Foss, um, uh, Alex Rodriguez, Damon John, a bunch of others. But on our Bitcoin day, we had a, a pretty good cast of characters. I'd love if you consider coming speaking. We actually uh, will talk to you about that. See if that's something that you'd be considered Wonderful. Come, coming to. That's going to be in June. Uh, I'd love to okay. chat with you about that. So uh, take care. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Todd. I'll see, see you soon. See you. you know, I'm going to explain to you. <laughs> There's a reason for it. So, so I did get that right. I did get that yeah, right. You got it right.